Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. Welcome to the Next Real Speakeasy on Rashpixel.fm. I'm Andy Nelson, and that over there is Pete Wright. The horror. <laughs> Each month on the Next Reel Speakeasy, we invite a guest from the film industry to join us, and instead of serving up their favorite cocktails, they serve up movies that they love so that we can all talk about them. We'd like to welcome our guest to this month's show, cinematographer Paul Cameron. Paul didn't get much exposure to photography growing up, but when he was about 15, his brother bought a Polaroid land camera. With that, he started taking lots of Polaroids, and that sparked his interest in photography and film in general. He went to school at State University of New York Purchase, but because he couldn't afford to make many of his own films, he started shooting everyone else's films. Before he could graduate, though, Paul was asked to leave the school after an unauthorized use of equipment to shoot an underground club show, the B-52s. Despite that setback, Paul continued to learn and eventually got into the union and landed an agent. Since then, Paul has worked on some of the most visually groundbreaking feature films of the past several decades. Projects such as Man on Fire and Deja Vu for director Tony Scott, as well as Scott's entry in BMW Films' short film series, The Hire. Swordfish and Gone in 60 Seconds for director Dominique Sena. Total Recall for director Len Wiseman. And Dead Man Down for director Niels Arden Oplev. 
Paul's work with Michael Mann on Collateral confirmed the capabilities of the still young digital medium, immortalized now as one of the first major studio films to embrace digital cinematography. The film earned Cameron a BAFTA Award and the LA Critics Award for Best Cinematography. Paul is currently lensing Walt Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales, to be released next summer. He also shot the pilot for the new HBO series Westworld, written and directed by Jonathan Nolan, which just started airing this past weekend. Welcome to the show, Paul. Well, thanks for having me. Paul, you you have finished shooting the first episode of Westworld. It's as we record this, it's going to release. I haven't been this looking forward to a show quite this much uh since maybe Breaking Bad, maybe before that. Please tell me that my enthusiasm is not misplaced. No, I don't think it's uh misplaced at all. It's um you know, it's a it's a show that was a uh, you know it was great to work on, and you know from the onset with uh, Jonathan Nolan, we knew the potential of the material, and you know fortunate enough to be part of the pilot and hear a lot of what's to come in the season. So I think you'll be fine. <laughs> I think okay, you'll be quite that's excited. all I wanted to know. In <laughs> fact, we could talk about the movie we're here to talk about tonight, but but mostly I I sit relieved. That's all I needed from you today. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Good. Oh, that's fantastic. But yes, we are here to talk about Apocalypse Now, which uh, you had selected a few choices for us to to pick from of your favorite films. Um, and this was at the top of your list. Uh, really, I mean, you sent a list of a bunch of fantastic films that we'd be happy to talk about. But uh, boy, Coppola in the 70s, he, uh, he was quite a, a filmmaker. And this uh, is definitely one that we were interested in talking about. So here we are, Apocalypse Now. Well, I just, it's a film, you know, for me, I don't think you can beat it. It's a, it's a mythical journey and, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, visually stunning and, um, it's just a captivating film on many levels. And, uh, I probably watch it twice a year still. So it's hard, hard, to, hard for me to watch movies all the time, but certainly that film. This is a film I discovered in college and uh, certainly ended up watching a good number of times back then. And it's just always stuck with me since then. It's, it's just always been a personal favorite. So I was very excited uh, that you picked it. It's a fascinating film in so many ways, not the least of which I think is the fact that even though it is set in the Vietnam War, uh, but hearing Coppola talk about it, it really he he didn't want to shoot a war story. He wanted to shoot a morality tale, right? The story of this transition of kings, and uh, it, in that regard, it doesn't really need to have been set in the Vietnam War, right? It doesn't really that that's not necessarily a requirement to tell this story. Uh, yet the surrealism, I think, what they what they went for to to capture the environment of the war certainly adds to the aesthetic. Uh, what is it about this as a as a, a non war war movie that I that it is that you think attracts you so much to the to the material? Well, again, it's um, you know it's 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 kind of a mythical journey into into darkness. It's a it's a it's about a man who who who. Uh, literally goes up river and, and faces his, his deepest fears and, you know, takes a hero's journey and, you know, does a heroic act and, um, you know, goes on, you know, and that's, that's really, you know, that's what, that's kind of the timeless aspect of it. And, um, you know, the, the Vietnam Cambodian backdrop is, you know, obviously timely historical and 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 relevant to the story in many ways but it's uh it also provided a um, you know kind of uh, an extreme backdrop for for uh this journey and and you know i mean it's it's you've got the, the deepest darkest jungles of of cambodia and and um, again timely historically it's interesting that it was actually uh, you know based on joseph conrad's novel heart of darkness i, I guess you could say loosely based but it, it certainly um is one of those stories that I really enjoy uh, what uh, John Milius, who wrote the script, and then Coppola, of course, kind of uh, worked on it as he was filming it. Um, I-, I love what they did with it, kind of taking the uh, the essential uh, essence, the themes of Heart of Darkness, and they found a way to translate all of that into a different place, which you don't see a lot with adaptations, but I really enjoyed that they did that here. In fact, I think it was in the 90s, I think Nicholas Roeg did an actual, just a straight-up uh, TV movie adaptation of Joseph Conrad's novel, which I don't think uh, was received very well. But I think, you know, this was a story that John Milius has talked about, how much he connected with when he was young. Obviously, these guys, uh, at this time, in this kind of collective that Coppola 
Coppola had gathered around him with Milius and George Lucas and all these guys as he was developing his Zoetrope Studios, they all seemed to be very much, you know, wanting to make films that meant something, wanting to tell uh, stories that were more than just what they had grown up with in in Hollywood in the in the fifties and sixties. They were really trying to push for something different, and I think that um, that they did a great job taking this story and kind of finding a way to, uh, you know, translate it into something that was very, I suppose, very personal and very, uh, you know, intense at the time for them. Well, for sure. I mean, it's, um, you know, again, very reflective of, of, you know, history, immediate history, but it's also, you know, for me, it's like a contemporary epic, you know, it's, um, you know, it's like, it's like the deer hunter, you know, it's, it's a, it's an epic film, you know, and, and quite honestly, you know, Apocalypse Now kind of uh, reflected a lot of U.S. politics and social beliefs and, and, um, you know, kind of the chaos of the war and, uh, you know, all, all, all the things that we feared about being in war, anybody who saw that film, you know, it was, it was a complete confrontation of those fears and, and those realities. And, uh, you know, it was, I think it was also a wake up call for a lot of, a lot of people watching it. And, you know, it's, it's easier to watch that material and the, the darkness of that material, uh, than obviously to be part of it. And, uh, um, you know, Coppola, Coppola had an insane vision and he, 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 he marched through it, you know, I forget what it took, you know, 300 and something days to film it. And, you know, the, the insanity with Brando and, you know, uh, you know, the, the challenges of being in the jungle with Storaro and, 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 you know, creating a beautiful imagery. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's quite the journey. Another element that I think is uh, interesting about this, this journey that they took in the script is, is tying it into Vietnam. Uh, Coppola had read a book by Michael Herr called, I think it was called Dispatches, which was, I believe, letters and things from people in the war, just kind of describing their experiences and just how harrowing it was and just kind of that internal struggle that pe- soldiers were having in the war. And this is a, a, an interesting example of voiceover narration that I think, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, screenwriters, uh, t- people teaching screenwriting, they're always just kind of uh, downplaying the, uh, you know, how uh, voiceover and narration, um, how much you should use it. They're like, oh, it's, it's overused. It's, it's, a, it's a way to get out of uh, actually getting the point of your story across and all that. And I think that you watch a movie like this, and I think there's something that brings that internal uh, element out that kind of pulls that uh, that sense of the, uh, the the internal struggle that these characters are going through. And it's it's done in such a way that I I don't know I find it mesmerizing just as I sit and listen to uh, to Martin Sheen kind of have his little internal dialogues. It's it's powerful. Great. It's also very elliptical. You know, you've got you know the, these kind of stream of consciousness. Uh voiceover you know that that's you know like you said it's very reflective of his character and his journey and it's uh kind of weaves in, in and out of the insanity and you know going up river and you know finding uh you know the bridge being blown up every day um and and trying to find out who's in charge and him trying to make sense out of it and you know that's really you know one of the biggest parts of it is he's just trying to make sense out of his own life and his own his own his own journey you know? in your work as a cinematographer today what do you find that you you are able to trace back to having learned from your experience ingesting digesting apocalypse now well certainly you know in terms of cinematography and the craft it's you know beautifully photographed uh, by Storaro and it's you know amazing use of, of natural light and um you know, incredible, uh, beautiful, fascinating lighting. You know, I mean, it's uh, there's a, a kind of minimalist style to his work in the film that's just stunning. You know, and it's uh, and I think that's kind of you know something I brought on in films with Tony Scott and kind of embracing and, and using natural light quite a bit. And I can see that that was a big thing for 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 Storaro in the film, and and you know of course there's gorgeous lit scenes, but it's kind of the use of of uh, natural light in a lot of ways, and um, there's a certain style to a lot of the film that goes in and out of of 
being off you know, eye lines and scenes photographed from, you know, with multiple characters from, you know, kind of edgier angles and stuff that, that also were, were, was something that was quite inspiring to me, you know, that you didn't have to always be on a direct eye line. And, you know, and I think it's also what you mentioned before is the kind of nature of, of, of the kind of poetic uh, cinematography that, that uh, is embraced in the film too. It's, you know, it's a, uh, we began for me seeing it in films like that and, and, uh, in bad, you know, Badlands and, uh, Malick's films at the time too, where they're, you know, kind of this visual elliptical style that, that was, was, uh, kind of different. It was kind of modernist. It's, um, uh, so that was very good. Speaking of elliptical style, something we talk about on the show is kind of the first shot and the last shot and how they kind of uh, uh, thematically connect and tie the whole movie together. And you've mentioned elliptical, kind of this elliptical storytelling. And definitely, you can see a lot of that in the first shot and the last shot. And really, it's it's almost hard to pull just the first shot and the last shot because Coppola uses so many um, uh, dissolves, these dissolves from a, a shot to a shot or, or multiple images on the screen at the same time. And you see a lot of the same imagery at the beginning and the end. I mean, the beginning starts with this line of palm trees. You hear kind of these helicopter, as they call it, the ghost helicopter sounds. Uh, and then, you know, you get the doors playing the napalm and you kind of get this dissolve of this uh, upside down Martin Sheen. And then at the end, you get essentially kind of the same thing. You get, the, you know, the boats leaving, you get a, a dissolve to the stone face and Willard's face and then fire burning. And then you get how Willard's face and the stone face that his his face kind of moves over and the eyes line up as we fade to black. It's an interesting pairing that does kind of tie into that elliptical uh, connection between the beginning and the end and how the the end is the beginning is the end sort of thing. You know, it's all this connected internal story as this person makes this journey. Yeah, but you know, what I love about it, what's different, you know, now in a lot of ways is is I don't think uh, Coppola was doing storyboards <laughs> of these sequences. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So, you know, suddenly, you know, you've got this, you're in the editing room and you've got this incredible shot of, you know, the helicopters coming over and the napalm exploding. And then you're sitting in a room about to shoot Martin Sheehan and the fans going above your head and you realize that that's the same image of looking up at the, you know, the, the rotor blades going over you. And I think Coppola is very instinctual that way. And he's, he's certainly, um, instinctual with performance that way. And it's, it's trusting that and it's, and then you get to the edit room and then you put those, you know, those ideas that you, you, you know, kind of had a year or two ago and you try them. And back then they, you know, let's try an optical dissolve, you know, and it's, it works and it, it adds a layer and it becomes, it becomes something interesting and, you know, editors helping find stuff, you know, while you're, while you're, you know, they're cutting in the end of the film too. It's just, um, you know, how do you tie it up? Well, you want to, you know, you want to, you want, you know, you want the end of your, your movie and your last shot to be the kind of defining moment. And it's, you know, it's all things burning and the infer the inferno at the end, and that's uh, you know I think he was pretty conscious about doing all that. I, I think that's a, a really interesting point. It's something I made in my notes that that uh, you know intentionality comes in this case after instinct, uh, mm -hmm. and, and you can sort of feel uh, Coppola saying, you know, what would be great if. Uh, it, it, the number of times I get that sense in the film is is uh, practically innumerable. I, I'm I'm always looking at a film like this, thinking, okay, if from the director's perspective, if he's holding up a mirror for us, what is his? You know, who in the film really represents him and his journey? And and I wonder what it would be like to see this film cold anymore because I've mm -hmm. watched so much of the behind the scenes stuff. I don't know. Uh, it, I don't know if I would appreciate it as much, not knowing the crazy journey that Coppola went on. On sort of being both Captain Willard and Colonel Kurtz, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, fighting his own inner demons deep in the jungles of the Philippines. Yeah. Uh, this is so much, so much, or as much a story of the craziness that he brought to it as it is a story of Willard and Kurtz. I think a lot of a lot of great directors innately create chaos. They manifest chaos and out of out of a struggle to kind of understand their film and understand the content. And, you know, the good ones are creatively chaotic and they're, they're, they're trying things and they're, 
you know, they're they're being you know fearless, and and they're trying to bring out the best in the actors, the best in the cinematographer, the production designer, everybody, and pushing everybody to their limits. You know, that's those are the positive ones, and um, you know, I think you know by nature that film was a struggle. It was you know, it's it's like other fil- you know famous films like that, like Das Boot or or whatever, where where these you know people go through these incredible journeys in their lives to make this film. And yeah, he's definitely both characters. He's Kurtz and, and, and Willard and he's, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to find himself, I think, you know? Well, and, and definitely, I mean, it's as a director, it's definitely a tool that he talks about this whole idea of wanting to, uh, wanting to get inside these characters heads, wanting the actors to really inhabit them, um, knowing that the actors really want to, uh, kind of really take it to places. I mean, he talks about that with Martin Sheen in that opening scene that Martin Sheen has, where he's really kind of releasing these own inner demons that he has and and how difficult it was for Coppola to kind of let Sheen do what he needed to do even though he just punched a mirror and now he's bleeding and getting blood everywhere you know do we need to stop production what's where's the responsibility lie and in the end they let it film and then they checked it uh, to make sure that he was okay but it's it's just it's interesting you know Coppola really um, was, uh, you know, pushing, I mean, he's really pushing the limits, um, to really let everybody try things. Well, he's pushing it, but he's also pushing it with, you know, uh, you listen at the time, a lot of actors were, were method actors too. A lot of people were, cla- you know, actors have been classically trained and, and that was the thing, you know, that was, you know, becoming the character was the thing, you know, and a lot of great directors still, push actors to do that, but I, you know, I'm seeing it less and less. Um, and you know, it's, uh, unfortunately sometimes, you know, because of schedules and everything, people don't take, you know, take these risks and push people the way they need to push them, directors, and push their actors. And, you know, they took the time to go deep, you know, they took the time to go very deep and, and, you know, you see the level of, performance out of Sheehan and the level of performance out of Forrest and you see the level uh, of performance out of Brando and and you know these are all iconic performances that that most people will never forget if they see the film once. You know? Do you think some of that is because uh, also because Coppola I mean essentially who's doing this as kind of an independent film I mean he's funding it himself essentially um, as opposed to going through a studio where he also had to answer to you know the the bottom line of the of the executive producers and and the the kind of corporate nature of that i mean i think some of that must be you know here he was in the jungle he was making this movie that went from you know a a nine-week shoot to what like two and a half year shoot uh just kind of uh, went through this own level of insanity that they all went on but i i certainly feel like a lot of that is just because i mean he was in a place i mean sure he was uh, mortgaging his his vineyards and he was kind of putting himself completely on the line to get this film made but it really was this this personal journey he willingly took to actually do this and i i just don't know i don't know if you're going to get that if you're it, you know even nowadays or even then if you were going through a studio no i mean listen it was also you know a similar time you know to, you know when he was making this film woody allen was asking for money for his films and you know part of the deal was he you know write a check for the full amount you know and no questions asked will you know deliver the film in you know 6 8 months you know and i think you know with with Coppola and Apocalypse Now is such a complex uh, undertaking, and certainly, you know, I know, you know, can only uh, can imagine that after you know a couple of weeks of shooting, that he realized that this was, you know, this was a film that was was worth risking everything for, and. Um, you know, sometimes financially, uh, directors go deep that way. We see it less and less now, but it's, um, you know, it's also just having to make it and having to finish it. And I think that's the other thing about artists in general, you know, is that it's, it's about finishing it, you know, and, and following through. And that's what he did. You know, it, it only took five times the amount of time they thought, you know. <laughs> five times the amount of time, a million, a million and a half feet of film, and yeah. uh, and and yeah. his famous line on hearing that Martin Sheen has actually had a heart attack. Uh, uh, Martin is dead when I say he's dead. Yeah, that's good. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's Coppola well, in the jungle, right there. That's Coppola in the jungle. Yeah, I mean, again, it was 
equally his journey as uh, his characters. <laughs> um, let's as we uh, work into the cast here. Speaking of Martin Sheen, he was actually a replacement for the original and shot Harvey Keitel, uh, which I find really interesting. And hearing Sheen talk about it. Uh, that he was nervous, that he had no military experience, and here he was replacing a guy who uh, was a Marine, had four years in the military, and actually, he, uh, Sheen says, Harvey knew the right end of the gun. Like, he he was the guy and, and f- felt really intense pressure taking over Keitel's shoes. Uh, I don't know. I, it's, it, you know, there's armchair quarterbacking, uh, you know, that, that could go on here, but really, uh, when you look at Martin Sheen's performance, that... His work in this film ended up um, uh, establishing him as one of those iconic performers. You know, listen, he, he, you know, he was such a young, vulnerable talent. So, you know, Keitel was, you know, coming out of the, 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 the mean streets era, you know, of, of the streets of New York. So different characters, different, you know, uh, on-screen personas for sure. But, I mean, I, I you know, listen, I love love Keitel and I love his work, his early work too, but the kind of, uh, you know, vulnerability and seeming, seemingly, you know, edginess of, of Martin Sheehan's lack of confidence, if that was the case, worked for the film, you know, uh, in an incredible way. You know, they, they, that, that performance is, is just, it's a stunning, stunning uh, piece of work. The um, I, I thought it was interesting that uh, Coppola himself said that uh, Harvey Keitel was fantastic, but his he's just such a an intense present actor that it it just didn't seem right for Captain Willard, who needed to be very kind of uh, almost in the background, reserved, just more internal, and and that I think was his struggle with Keitel as much as he uh, loved him and thought he was a a, a great actor. Uh, and that's difficult. I, I can only imagine how hard it is for a director to uh, to have to uh, cut someone from a film, particularly after they've started filming. Yeah, it's got to be a hard thing, but it's, you know, uh, unfortunately those decisions have to get made sometimes. And, and you know, casting specifically is something that's, you know, there's so much pressure for, you know, from financiers and box office even back then that, you know, it was a big consideration. It's much more now, but it's, Big directors wanting, you know, in my experience with with some directors that wanted to hire people instinctually and didn't do it, the films have suffered, you know, and the, and they've never forgiven themselves. And I, you know, I think that's something that, you know, Coppola made the choice, and 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 it was a good one at the time. Yeah, definitely a great uh, choice for this film. And speaking of just kind of casting uh, big people or, or stunt casting uh, in the 70s, I mean, certainly Marlon Brando was a big name and bringing him on uh, for Colonel Kurtz, uh, contracted to film for three weeks at a million dollars a week. I, that could be considered stunt casting, I suppose, at the time. Um, you know, obviously they'd worked together on The Godfather, but, uh, you know, here he is, this uh, this actor coming in, um, and it just, you know, hearing the stories about Marlon Brando on set, I mean, obviously he shows up, he's he's gained a lot of weight, he's very kind of embarrassed about his weight, and 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 ends up sitting around talking to Coppola for like five days before they film, um, just to have these discussions about the role and, and how to play Kurtz and, and going back and forth and wanting to change Kurtz's name. It just sounds like, uh, you know, an actor stalling and really just, uh, it sounded like he was struggling trying to figure out what to do with this. He's such a powerful actor and was always a powerful actor. And, you know, whatever, whatever was happening in his life with the weight thing or whatever, this is, you know, a monumental performance in so many ways and again he knew the risks of of hiring brando he knew you know he knew the costs involved the entourage that was coming the you know uh and the possibility of not shooting for a few days and that's what happened they they shut it down and they talked and they figured it out and you know the film was only better for it i mean it's it's you know um I can't imagine on a big film right now if, uh, you know, all of a sudden we get a call saying, hey, we're going to shut it down for five days while we talk to, you know, figure this out. It just never happens, <laughs> you know, and it's just fabulous. He, you know, he took, uh, you know, I think, again, Coppola, for him, it was, you know, the rest of the world didn't matter. It only mattered of solving 
what he had to solve to make the film as as great as possible. Well, and he's he's talked about how I mean he walked into this film not even knowing how he wanted it to end, and he talks about that quite a bit as he's filming. He's still trying to sort out the ending for the film, and I think part of the the five days sitting there with Brando. I mean, Coppola may may say you know yeah Brando came and and uh, he didn't want to act for five days. We while we had these discussions, very likely some of that could have been Coppola. You know, he's just like well let's maybe we can hash this out and figure out how this thing should go. Well, as evidenced yeah. too by the the uh, the amount of footage that was covered, that was just straight up Brando improvising. Um, you know, clearly there is there wasn't as much of a direction. Uh, you know, or or they wouldn't have ended up with so much of that uh, that kind of material. It feels like to me. It'd be great to see all that. That's yeah. for sure. I'd love to see it all. Yeah, every <laughs> is bit it on the behind the scenes or no? They, a, there's a li- there's a little bit of extra, but not 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 that yeah. I've heard. They do, yeah. They have the full uh, run of him reading the uh, T. S. Eliot poem. You can listen to yeah, that. Yeah, that's true. That's the whole true. thing, but uh, um, yeah, I, you know, Brando is such an interesting, compelling actor to watch, and and I think that uh, I. I he um, makes this movie for me as much as Willard. I mean, these two, they're such a, a perfect yin-yang um, of the story, as, as really almost as if they kind of become one at the end. And, you know, that shot of uh, Captain Willard coming out of the water where he's kind of painted and everything, it almost, you know, his face almost has this kind of Kurtz look to it, the way that his hair is all slicked back, almost looking like he himself has, has shaved his head almost as if he's kind of becoming the same character. And uh, I, I just, I find these two guys such a perfect pairing in this film. I, I really enjoy watching them work off of each other in that last uh, that last sequence. Well, and I think their their final fight, you know, the, it's it's sort of a shadow boxing kind of machete thing where you actually, I, I mean, they cut the same, they cut the same silhouette for me, right? When they're all, they're backlit from the outside staircase into the temple. And and as you can sort of feel uh, the way Willard is, is literally and figuratively taking the mantle with every with every um, uh, slice. Uh, it's it's really fantastic. Uh, the other iconic performance, well, actually, the other controversial performance, at least on set, was that of Dennis Hopper, uh, the photojournalist who apparently, and I'm not sure if this is real or if it was uh, manufactured. Apparently, Brando had some real trouble with uh, with Hopper, and and I certainly not the. Oh, Not right. the first nor the last, but I, right. I Hopper's. <laughs> you know, when you when you look at them on set, you know, together, it really feels like you know the 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 kind of the lion and the really annoying hyena. Uh, to uh-huh. me. That's sort of the relationship <laughs> yeah, yeah. of them together uh, that I find fascinating. Hopper also uh, wi- uh, reportedly wildly underprepared or uh, really struggling to figure out what his role was. Well, yeah, I'm sure it's, it was, you know, it was just a wild idea. Let's bring him over, you know, and I'm sure the discussions were, you know, he was going to play a different character and he wanted to play this kind of documentary photojournalist, you know, <laughs> wild character. And uh, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure he just did whatever he wanted. And, and I, I'm sure everybody just hoped he showed up every day. <laughs> yeah, no but kidding. It's, uh, it definitely feels like Hopper. I mean, it, it just has that Easy Rider sort of vibe going all through it, which, I, you know, again, just feels so a part of the time, and it, it ends up feeling so wildly appropriate for the film. It's interesting to see him play such a minimalist character at this age, you know? I mean, he was he is the character that sort of gets stomped on. He is the one who actually allows us to make the, the transition from the military into the tribe. Uh, so he's kind of the gateway to this other world, uh, uh, he's a, a utility player in that regard, certainly in the construction of the script. But um, but then to be minimized so quickly as as kind of the annoying uh, uh, the annoying parrot is is really interesting. Robert Duvall, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kilgore. Yeah, Duvall's great. I mean, <clears throat> again, he's uh, another you know classic iconic character, and um, uh, you know, I mean, Bobby's a fabulous actor. Certainly one of the ones who has delivered uh, some of the most memorable lines from from the film. Uh, you know, that, you know, just the, you know, I love the smell of napalm in the morning and Charlie don't surf. I mean, those two lines alone just seem to have entered the uh, the uh, lexicography of, of things that people say now without necessarily even having seen the film, you know? 
And no, I mean, he's great. He just he walks through fields with you know they're exploding and and with you know getting putting on his bathing suit ready to go surfing. It's fantastic. You know, <laughs> he plays blast music out of the helicopter and and uh, you know he he does represent kind of uh, you know the 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 strength and fearlessness of of, uh, of a warrior. You know. And I mean, again, Robert Duvall had worked with Coppola before on the uh, the Godfather films. But uh, I mean, seriously, when has Robert Duvall ever done anything that wasn't just a powerhouse performance? He's just he's just one of those actors who is just always riveting when he's on the screen. I've just always enjoyed watching him. And here, it's just it's great, even though he is such a a, a bit part for such a, a small portion of the film. It 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 really kind of helps define this film as much as any of these other performances. Just it's these characters are all such interesting glimpses into the types of personalities that were scattered all through the Vietnam war. And really, I mean, you could probably look at them in almost any war. Mm. I wonder how the films perceived now, you know, in terms, you know, younger, younger audiences seeing it for, uh, for the first time, you know, because it's, you know, now this is, you know, a war 40 years ago, you know, and it's a story, um, from quite a while back, so I wonder, I wonder, I wonder what that's like. I I do too, and actually, I I this is that's actually why I had children uh, mm-hmm. was so that I could experiment with their film taste. <laughs> so you could show them apocalypse <laughs> yeah. now. Yeah, and so they're not quite there yet, but give me a couple of years, and <laughs> I will I will report back. <laughs> Uh, let's see. The, in terms of the the rest of the cast, we've got the guys on the boat: uh, Frederick Forrest, Sam Bottoms, and uh, uh, Lawrence Larry Fishburne, there he is. and hey, good old Albert Hall as chief. Yep. Yep, yep. A fantastic set of boys on the boat, uh, both sort of terrifying and cavalier uh, in their approach and their experience to the war. Well, they also, you know, it, looking back, it seems like this wonderful ensemble cast. But these are, you know, I, I, I bet you if you look back, it'd be very few actors that actually worked with other actors. You know, it's you know, outside of the Coppola, uh, usual Coppola crowd, and. Um, Forrest had worked with Coppola too at that point, right? I think. Yeah, he, he was in the conversation did, uh, years yeah, before. Yeah, the conversation, which is awesome. I mean, it's a, yeah. um, but all together, I guess it was. It's kind of the Coppola ensemble in some ways, and uh, you know, it's 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 such a, a magnetic group, and these guys are just you know they they just all work so well. They just seem to be naturally. Net, you know, like they've been in combat for months and, and, and you know, just flawless in their performances. This is a, a period of time where they, you know, the, the way that they cast this, I just, I, I love that they really kind of took time to do stuff in, in ways that felt kind of, in a way, kind of old school or theatrical. I mean, Coppola had all these different guys in. I think Fred Roos was doing the casting and, and they basically just did all these readings and they had a bunch of different actors in the room and they would kind of all group, do these group auditions and he would have people change roles and really try to get a sense as to you know who is working best and uh, it's it's interesting and going through some of the the special features getting to see some of the the uh, the shots from those uh, readings when they were doing it and you can see Nick Nolte in there trying it out and it's it's really interesting to see how they would really kind of you know he would kind of uh, mix and match and try to find the right uh, roles and yeah he did an amazing job casting these guys and I mean knowing that Larry Fishburne came on when he was 14 and then he ended up uh, having his 15th and 16th birthdays on set and seeing the movie released when he was 17. Uh, I don't think you punched that hard enough. He had his 14th and or 15th and and 16th birthdays on set. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but this is again, it was a different time, you know, than and Coppola. They did did sit in a room, they sat face to face, right? Did they bounce things off of each other? And like you said, it was different combinations. You know, you think you're gonna, you know, I'm sure it was like you wanted to cast. In, in a different way, and he shuffled it around, and the chemistry exploded with the different characters that they took on the personas, and that's that's what he went with, you know. And and you know, unfortunately, casting it's hard to get actors all in a room together apparently now in cast. <laughs> oh, yeah. you know, it's all done, you know, it's all done uh, uh, much more through 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 agents and uh, tapes and skypes and yeah, right. Uh, Act- they, actors know, don't they, travel for auditions time, anymore. So you know, you want the part, you know, you come and let's talk about it, you know, and they, 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 they do it, you know, um, you know, there's, but there's also, a, you know, a depth of talent that Coppola is always, you know, he's always had in all of his films. And I think it's, you know, no character is unimportant to him. No face is unimportant to him. No, no detail of the film is unimportant to him. So when it comes to casting, it's probably outside of the script is 
the most important thing, you know. You know, there's uh, an interesting, uh, well, obviously, this film had its, uh, I guess you could say a rebirth in, uh, I think it's around 2000, when they uh, re-edited it and uh, created the Redux version, which uh, kind of uh, put a bunch of sequences back in, including the uh, the uh, the French plantation. And we, of course, have a few uh, great actors in there, uh, Christian Marquand and uh, Aurora Clement, who ended up uh, meeting Vittorio Storaro here and uh, got married to him and uh, still married to this day. Um it's it's an interesting uh, uh, journey watching this film kind of in its original form and then watching it in the redux and kind of seeing some of these sequences added back in. Uh, you know, what what's your take on it? Do you have a preference? Do you... Uh, do well, you- yeah, I mean, I didn't really, you know, I'll be honest with you. I, I, you know, again, such a fan of the original film that the redux kind of... Um, Certain scenes, like you know, the one you're describing with the with you know the, the plantation, colonial plantation stuff, seemed to be like uh, I felt like I was just taken out of a, a movie that I was very you know or or an experience I was very familiar with. It was like it's like listening to a record and putting you know that you're you know you grew up with a record and then suddenly um, they put a new song in the middle of it that that was unreleased, you know, and it, it changes the tone of the record. And you know, for me. You know, I felt uh, structurally the film was great. The original was great, and you know, I understand the 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 want to to make it better and and incorporate scenes that weren't in the film. But it just you know, to me, it just didn't work. You know, I, you know, for me, it hit me the uh, it was sort of the other direction. That French plantation scene, at least from a narrative perspective, it adds so much of the politics of the why we're here and why this is a struggle, and it sets mm-hmm. up the the futility of the war and makes that sort of mythic journey all that more powerful for mm. Willard to head into the woods because now he has a much more clear perspective of the fact that his journey is not one that is going to be of any utility to the military itself because we've established that their right. their mission there is useless. It was much more of a political statement and now mm-hmm. he realizes he still has to go. He is compelled to go into the to into the woods and finish this story in the jungle and and so for me I, I found myself this time in particular really appreciating that that sequence was back uh, and I was surprised at, at, at that because I, I like you I, I found myself I, I really appreciated the original cut so or the theatrical cut yeah I think both cuts for me work really well I'm kind of uh, I, 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 I think I'm one of those guys who I just once I discovered this film i just completely fell in love with it and just having more was just always a good thing i just really enjoyed it (laughs) and having seen hearts of darkness um before long before i ever saw redux i really got a sense of some of the stuff that was missing and i believe that they actually showed a good chunk of the french plantation sequence there so i kind of was already familiar with it i knew what was coming um i i don't know i i i enjoy i enjoy having all of that in there it's just all that extra uh, meat and potatoes that for me um, you know, I don't know. I'm happy with either one. I actually rewatched the original um, to prepare for this one because I had I'd seen the Redux. I don't think I I don't think I had gone back to watch the original since the Redux came out. So for me, it was actually really refreshing to go back and just kind of see the original again and and just kind of reconnect to that original version. And you know, I mean, you know, he liked all the the stuff that was in there. He just it was one of those things cutting for time for the distributor, and that's just kind of the the nature of the industry. It is a business. You got to do these sorts of things to actually make things happen. The thing that. That's most fascinating for me about the, the Redux in, in particular that I, I don't know of any other film, at least I, I've heard no story of any other film where this has happened, where they actually went back and and recut the film from the source material, uh, it, you know, and treated it like a new movie. And, and that sets this experience apart for me. And I find myself really wanting to explore the new decisions that they allowed themselves to to make by actually going back to the original uh, source, not just for these sequences that they took out and replaced in in whole, mm-hmm. but but for every cut, I, I think it's a it's interesting to look at. I wasn't aware of that. That's great. Is it the same editor? Uh, this is Walter Murch who went back into the second one. Yeah, he was one of the editors uh, when it when it first came out, but uh, I think it was just him working on Redux. And Walter, he must have been with them through the whole shoot. 
He was, yeah, I believe he was, but I think he was more focused on the the sound side of things. I, I think he um, uh, he did some of the editing. I know they kind of split up the editing. I think Jerry Greenberg really kind of just was doing the helicopter sequence. Like one report says he was editing that for a full year. Uh, Lisa Lisa Fruchtman uh, was another of the editors, and Walter Murch. So I, I, I think that um, it sounded like Coppola would kind of give people different uh, sequences to kind of have them uh, just play around with it and just see how different people's opinions brought different scenes to life, which definitely seems like a kind of a Coppola uh, zoetrope sort of way of thinking. Uh, Andy, you made a note on the theory of of philosophy and spirituality of color. What is that all about? Well, I know Coppola definitely talked about... Uh, um, Vittorio and just kind of how he and uh, Vittorio kind of worked this uh, as they were went along filming. Um, they just started playing with color, and I, I think it sounded like they both kind of fell in love with those those color uh, f- smoke flares. They would they would uh, put those out there, and just and they just both fell in love with these colors, and so they really started playing with the different colors and what they could do with them, and and how the colors kind of changed things and and uh, created different uh, vibes for certain sections of the film. And Vittorio certainly seems like a cinematographer who has adapted that philosophy. Through his career, I just I feel like he's directed or he's been the director of photography on some some films that have just amazing use of color. And um, as a as a cinematographer, I mean, obviously, you know, you're really working with the light and you're playing with kind of the look of the films and everything. But I mean, you go to a film like this, and then you see a film like The Last Emperor, and I just feel like he really has a, a, a good hand in in tying some of that the philosophies of color into the way that he's helping the director tell the story. What's your sense of that? Well, I, you know, I feel the same way. It's, you know, listen, he, you know, he certainly has explored color in the most kind of subtle emotional ways than, than, you know, uh, many cinematographers. And I think he developed, uh, you know, he developed uh, kind of the need to explore things, you know, for, you know, how to enhance things emotionally. And, and I know it's been a, a pursuit his whole life to, to, to kind of complete that in many ways. And, um, you know, certainly working with Bertolucci early on, uh, to me was some of the best, you know, best uses and, uh, uh, the conformist and, and, you know, there were more, more, more chances back then photographically, I think in terms of, of, of putting that out there and, and, you know, it's his work is some of the most sublime music color out there. Just beautiful stuff. And he, he would go on to work with uh, Coppola in One from the Heart and um, uh, Tucker, The Man in His Dream, which is uh, just I one of my favorite Coppola films, and then his segment in New York Stories. Um, and I think he ties in really well with uh, with the production design, Dean Tavalaris and the production design here. I, I think it's just also top notch. I really enjoy um, just all of this stuff. Even though you hear these stories about, you know, Coppola and the whole, you know, the typhoon destroying the whole the 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 set and having to get it rebuilt and all that. But I think that you know all of these people just rode with all of that so well, just making some uh, some beautiful stuff for this film. Yeah, I mean, listen, he's used to it. I mean, he's done some. You know, sheltering sky and uh, little Buddha, and big, you know, big films, big journeys. This, this was, you know, I'm sure for him was a uh, was, you know, early on was just the beginning of a an incredibly long journey in his life. I mean, he he certainly has one of the best careers and best bodies of work of uh, any cinematographer out there. The uh, the other big thing that I think came from this film, I mean, obviously the look and and everything is key, and the editing, which took a very long time. Um, the sound design for this film is, it's really kind of, it came at a critical time. Uh, Coppola and Walter Murch really wanted to do something with the sound. And uh, Walter Murch essentially, I mean, this is kind of the grandfather of the whole 5.1 stereo surround. I mean, they they released this in quadraphonic sound. And there had been other films that had played around with that. But this really is where it all kind of uh came from the way that they were separating the different speakers and they especially I mean, geez, right from the very beginning when you hear that ghost helicopter coming it kind of goes around you several times and just from speaker to speaker it was beautiful sound work all through this film uh, and i think you can't go it, you can't talk about this film without talking about just the brilliance of walter murch and just everything that he did uh, working with coppola to kind of define the sound of this film yeah i mean i saw it listen the first time i saw it was at the zigfeld in, in new york city and uh, 
I had, I had wow. never experienced anything like that. Like you said, is like suddenly helicopters were coming from behind and through and beyond me, you know, and then the explosions and then obviously, you know, everything from, from, you know, the mixing on the war, war tracks to the music, to the dialogue, to the voiceover was, you know, um, you know, for me, beginning of this kind of modernist soundtrack experience, you know, and it was incredible. Carmen Coppola uh, is the man uh, behind the music, uh, uh, written for orchestra, and then translated to synth. So fascinating, and it seems kind of fitting for the the, the tone of the film. Uh, it seems uh, certainly for the time, the Moog synthesizer, uh, just that whole sound, um, it, it just kind of has that, that ethereal, otherworldly sound that really fit for this film. And my understanding is that they used, it was the largest, at, uh, at the time, the largest Moog synthesizer uh, in existence that they used for this film. But And then and then Mickey Hart and his, uh, his group, uh, what's his group? The Rhythm Devils, I believe? Um, they uh, came on to do all of the uh, the percussion and like the intense percussion uh, bits that you have, particularly toward the end. Just lots of uh, lots of really intense, great stuff. I I surprise myself with it, that I really do like the the music, the soundscape, the overall synthesized soundscape. I usually don't, and it takes me to this dark kind of John Carpenter place when I hear this <laughs> kind of stuff. But uh, but it really, I, I really find it. I mean, to your point, Andy, I am so surprised that I actually hear the whole thing and. F- feel like it is all connected it it doesn't sound dated to me it sounds of a period and and uh, i really appreciate it uh but for me uh, this film will always be uh, inextricably connected to uh the doors yeah uh, and the end i mean that's that sets the tone for the entire film the trailer all of the marketing is around uh that quintessentially uh perfect piece yeah, and it's it's funny because uh, Coppola was in film school with uh, several members of the Doors, and this was you know that early th- time when Jim Morrison was trying to figure out what to do, and he and some of his bandmates were in film school, and uh, I, I don't know if Coppola was able to just ask them directly, "Hey, let me use some of your music in your movie." But yeah, they definitely connected, and yeah, I completely agree with you, Pete. The Doors. Um, feel iconic with this film and, and beginning the film with the end, I think is a, a kind of a, I think it's a perfect way to start this film and it might be a little bit of an in joke by Coppola as well. She is kind of channeling more, you know, uh, Morris in a bit too, you know, for me watching it. It's, um, you know, it's, it's definitely like he, he's letting go and, and uh, you know, when he's in his room with, in the beginning of the film, and when he was running ju- in the jungle at the end, it was uh, it was quite quite perfect to have uh, Morrison playing. Absolutely. The other thing that always stands out to me as as an iconic piece of this film, and actually, the, as I think back to it, this is actually my introduction to this film. Was the just fantastic, beautiful, iconic poster that Robert Peake uh, designed for it? Just that that incredible, uh, you know, the the dark the black poster with that red sun and and uh, brando's face and uh, j- yeah the burning bridge and you have you know martin sheen up in the corner that to me was my introduction to this film and it was an image that haunted me and i never really knew uh anything about the movie i just uh, that image was just such a haunting image and uh, when i saw the film i really was able to kind of finally understand you know what this poster was about and why it looked the way it did yeah. It's, yeah, it's frightening. <laughs> it's actually yeah, a frightening right. poster. <laughs> it really is. But it's but it's beautiful and in it, you know, in I think but you know, there was also uh, a desire then to make, you know, with posters specifically to give a give a feeling of this film, you know, giving feeling films in the seventies and and show some of the content in a way that was extremely imaginative and, you know, obviously, you know, a lot of posters lean toward heavy graphics or whatever, but this one has a lot of attributes from the film, including I think it also has helicopters going through the. It does. End, it, right? it, I mean, there were actually two uh, of these posters that he'd done. One of them with the burning bridge and the faces. The other that is much more gentle, and it it, it really harkens to the mystery of what is upriver. It's just the the um, you know the burnt orange river with a mm. lot of helicopters in the very far distance over the sunset right. there in the jungle, and it and there is no face. There are there are no faces, no burning bridge. It's just the river and the jungle and fog and the helicopters. And so when you look at these two, I think they use the the uh, heavily the the um, Brando Sheen poster 
on Redux uh, as well. So that one has abs- has sort of supplanted, I think, the original. But uh, but it's fascinating looking at these side by side to see kind of the transformation that they've made with these posters. Both of those were were Bob Peak. Yeah. A lot of great stuff from him. This film uh, did really well for itself. Uh, you know, once it was released, I know they were kind of a, a unsure of what was going to happen at the time, and they they played it at con and everything. But uh, it did. It was received pretty well. It ended up uh, at the Academy Awards for 1979. It won uh, Best Cinematography and Best Sound, um, both of which uh, I think are fitting. It was nominated for Best Picture, uh, lost to Kramer versus Kramer. Um, nominated for Best Supporting Actor, Robert Duvall, who lost to Melvin Douglas for being there. Um, Coppola was nominated for, nominated for Best Director, but lost to Robert Benton for Kramer vs. Kramer. Uh, likewise, Best Adapted Screenplay, and then Best Art Direction, Set Decoration, and Best Film Editing. Those nominations, uh, those lost to all that jazz. Uh, you know, not a lot I can argue with. I really enjoy all of those films. Um, Kramer vs. Kramer, I mean, I, we've talked about that on the show. I really love that film. Um, I, I, I think that uh, Apocalypse Now may stand a little higher in my mind um, over Kramer versus Kramer, despite the strength of the film. But um, um, that's where it was with the uh, with the Academy Awards, which I think is, uh, you know, I think considering uh, the struggles that Coppola went through making this, I think it might have uh, felt good to at least get some nominations out of it. That's that's exactly where I am on this, Andy, just because it feels like emotionally more satisfying to think that all of the craziness and the work that went into making this film over years, they should have gotten something more. In terms of the uh, not, but you know, what are you going to do? Yeah, I don't know if they thought about it that much. I know, <laughs> that's the, that's I don't the know. Loss. and I'm sure, I'm sure there was a big party with Vittorio that yeah. night. So yeah, I'm sure they all enjoyed it. Right, exactly. They still had a good time. How yeah, did it actually so. uh, perform at the time, Andy? Uh, this film did uh, did well for itself. I mean, you know, going into a film that is supposed to be a, a nine week, uh, about twelve million dollar budgeted film, uh, this film ended up. Uh, um, you know, it cost about 30, in the end, about $31.5 million. Um, it was released August 15th, 1979, and uh, ended up, um, uh, let's see, it ended up making domestically about $83.5 million, and internationally about $2.5 million. So all told, definitely made its money back, and it ended up making an adjusted profit per finish minute of about $1.1 million per finished minute. So it did pretty good for itself in our list of movies. Especially for about such here. a long movie. Yeah, absolutely. And he got and he got to keep his house. So. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> he did. He got to keep the house. And, this was this we, made this for the, the birth of Zotrope, right? So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah and uh, this is uh, probably why we still are able to drink some of his Coppola wines. <laughs> there you go. Toast Apocalypse Now. I think we should uh, we should rank it. Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel and you will see our list of uh, all of the films, over 260 films that we have uh, ranked on this film, side by side, filmo a filmo. We're going to do it with Apocalypse Now uh, right now. Andy? All right. First up, Apocalypse Now or Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? I'm for me, it's easy. Yeah, uh, Apocalypse, it's Apocalypse now. now for me. Apocalypse, for sure. All right. Apocalypse Now or Contagion, little Steven Soderbergh uh, disease film. Definitely Apocalypse Now for me. Me too. Uh, Apocalypse Now. <laughs> to do it. Apocalypse Now or Aliens. Getting up there. This is Ooh. where it gets hard. I think if I if I were sitting on a desert island and I had only Aliens and Apocalypse Now, I would probably put on Aliens first. Wow. I know. Aliens first. Yeah. But that's my that's my era, right? I mean, I that's <laughs> I grew up, you know, that was much more of uh, my period. Oh, it's a stunning film, you know, yeah. completely different. I'm afraid I'll have to go Apocalypse. Oh, so it's up to me. Tiebreaker. <sighs> yeah. I, uh, man, sorry, Paul. I, I, <laughs> I'm going to go with You're going aliens. aliens. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, again, it's uh, of my era. That was uh, definitely a big film for me when I was young. Um, Apocalypse Now or LA Confidential? Oh, this is a this is a sad one. Oh, it's tough to put these together. Sad against one, yeah. each other. I didn't know that was going to happen. Um, Especially with uh, the recent loss of Curtis Hansen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go Apocalypse, though. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I am really stuck. That's a tough one. Oh, I think I've got to go Apocalypse again. You know, yeah. I love LA Confidential. You know, Chinatown. I would, you know, if you told me Chinatown, then we have a real 
<laughs> I uh, I'm I feel lucky that that I can. It's a principled loss, so my vote doesn't matter. Uh, but I I I think I would be LA Confidential on this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, Apocalypse Now is still taking it. Yeah. Uh, Apocalypse Now or Ace in the Hole? Billy Wilder, Kirk Douglas. Uh. That's definitely Apocalypse <laughs> Now. Hand, hands down, that's wow. an easy one. You're going to have to go. I can barely remember it. Okay. Uh, Apocalypse Now for me also. All right. Good. Apocalypse Now or Fight Club? Fight Club. <laughs> really? <laughs> Fight Club. I love Fight Club so much. Oh, yes. Oh, David's not listening. Um, I think David would be happy if I said Apocalypse Now. Uh, I'm Apocalypse Now also. Um, yeah. That's such All a right. Film. I did my part. There you did your part. You did your part. <laughs> uh, Apocalypse Now or The Fisher King. Some Terry Gilliam action there. Um, Apocalypse Now for me, though. Mm, God. I like I that you're, Fisher I like you're struggling on these, Paul. No, it's, you know, Fisher King is stunning. It's a, it's a great story, humanistic story. Um, but I'll go with the epic again, you know. Apocalypse, I'm afraid. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Fisher King man on that one, but... Uh, okay. All right, Apocalypse Now or The Matrix? Oh, oh dear. dear. Now, I've gotten in trouble recently for ranking The Matrix higher than some other excellent films. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've, we've gotten mail. So I'm. this is kind of... I'm, I'm sensitive. <laughs> Apocalypse Now for me. I think I'm Apocalypse Now, too. Okay, then I'll, I'll say Apocalypse Now. <laughs> <laughs> Now you're getting it. You just wait it out. There we go. All right. Wait it out. There you go. Well, that lands it at number 34 on our list of films, which is uh, really high. Uh, 34 out of uh, uh, 265. So it's way up there. Um, we're, we have uh, Network is number one on our list. Outstanding. But uh, yeah, I mean, this is uh, of the speakeasy films. Personally, this is uh, this is my favorite of all the speakeasy films that we've talked about on the show so far. So for Letterboxd, this is an easy five star film for me. Oh, yeah. Easy five. Easy five. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, Paul, here we go. We did. That was a fantastic pick. Uh, It's like it's like you you just really nailed it. It's a pick that we absolutely need on our list and our catalog of films that we've talked about on this show. So for that, thank you very much. What are you doing right now that you're uh, that you're happy and excited to talk about? Give us a plug. Well, right now I've got uh, you know, I, I think you know we've got the the pilot for uh, Westworld coming out in about a week or a week or so on HBO and I'm just over in London shooting um, a film called The Commuter with uh, Jama Collette Sarah, a Liam Neeson film, and Vera Farmiga. And uh, we're, we got about 10 more days of principal photography on that. And uh, heading back to Los Angeles to do the digital intermediate for Pirates, Dead Men Tells No Tales, which did a little over a year ago. And we're, we're finishing that up for summer release. So um, looking forward to coloring that. And, and uh, that's about it. Going to head back uh, to the U.S. and finish that and see what happens. So once, just out of curiosity, so once you shoot a film like, uh, I mean, a big film like Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales, how long are you uh, doing the, uh, the, uh, the coloring for a film like that? Well, actually, the film, you know, typically they, they try to finish within a year and usually the you know release date uh, is within a year of principal photography in this case i i think uh they wanted to you know, hold off and have a summer release in in july so uh jerry bruckheimer in the studio decided to go for for a longer finish on the film um so the actual uh, amount of time is pretty much the same, no matter what uh, you know. A film this size is probably about three weeks of coloring, three to four weeks of coloring. So, um, you know, it takes a lot. There's a lot of visual effects, a lot of layers. So, yeah, it takes a, a little bit of work, you know. And it's you know it's done digitally and you know, it's coming out well. And uh, look forward to it. Do you find yourself having to uh, like? Did you have to go back quite a bit to the previous films to t- try to tie in a similar look, or, or how did that work? Were you allowed to kind of have some free reign? It's uh, you know, Derek Walski, the cinematographer for the first four, is you know an amazing uh, director of photography, and um, you know I think we were trying to you know both both myself and the directors were trying to kind of. Um, Q 
carry on parts of the look of, of the of the franchise aspect of it, but you'll see some new stuff and um, you know some different lighting styles and you know uh, hopefully uh, some good surprises. Fantastic. Well, we can't wait to check that out. And of course, Westworld, uh, lots of great stuff coming. Um, uh, where should people find you? Uh, are you on Twitter, Instagram? Are you online at all? Do you have a website you want people to look at? Um, I do. I have a website, paulcamerondp.com. Great. Okay, fantastic. Well, Paul, thank you again so much for joining us the next Real Speakeasy uh, today. Good to hear from you guys. For those of you out there, we hope you enjoyed the show. If you like what you heard, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Instagram, Pinterest, Letterboxd, Flickchart, and YouTube. And of course, don't forget to head on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and comment. It really does help more people find us. Thanks again for tuning in. And until next time, I'm off to head up the river. I'm gonna use you to be my friend. I love having these wonderful chats on movies we like with all these industry guests talking about some of their favorite movies. So many great conversations on that show about so many great movies. We have so much fun having these conversations, but producing the show week after week does require a lot of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these incredible conversations. The Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals links to the source material for all the adapted film discussions on the Next Reel's family of podcasts. Purchasing through our links supports the show. It's your one-stop shop for Amazon and Apple links where you can buy your copy of the original source material. Original material for movies we like, movies like Casino Royale. The Silent Partner. Never Let Me Go. Silver Linings Playbook. There Will Be Blood, based on Upton Sinclair's Oil. I believe it's Oil! Oh, yeah. I forgot the exclamation point. (laughs) Plus, by using those links to buy your next read, Apple and Amazon show us a little bit of love, which allows you to support our family of shows with minimal effort. TheNextReel.com slash originals. It's a great way to support the show and find your next page turner. That's right. Head over to TheNextReel.com slash originals to pick out your next read and dig in today. (laughs) 